I want to ask everybody here in the room today, um, if you could think of one, maybe two characteristics um, that you dislike the most um, <clears throat> about other people. Maybe it's a person in your family or a person in your community, a person that you know personally. Um, if there was one characteristic you could point out and say, I really, really dislike that particular characteristic, what would it be? Now, um, there's a whole host of things. One of the things that people hate is lies. Um, and this is kind of related to that, actually. And um, here is one area I think most of us could agree that we would dislike the most, and that is tail bearing and slander. None of us like to be slandered, and none of us like to have other people going around and, and talking about us in a negative light. And uh, that's going to be our topic today. We're going to discuss this. And um, I think it's a very, very, very important topic for us to go over. Uh, I think there's a lot of confusion on the issue. There's uh, studies out there called Lashon Hara, things like that. You might have heard about it. Um, Lashon Hara just means evil tongue in Hebrew. And uh, the Jews are very much um, against this kind of thing, this tail bearing and slander. And, um, they have a good reason for it, and uh, I think we ought to have a good reason for it. And I, I think that um, it's one of those things that we probably all experienced at some point in our life. And uh, how many of us have ever carelessly said things about another person you realize later was slanderous, or maybe you just couldn't restrain yourself because your bitterness was so great that you were so offended Maybe you engaged in it yourself, and yet we all hate it. And yet, it's one of those things that if we're not careful, can we can find ourselves getting caught up in. And so, I want to make sure that we have a biblical view of what slander is, what tail-bearing is, um, evil speaking, things like that. And um, there is a central command in the Torah that deals with this very topic and it's found in Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 16 it says you shall not go about as a talebearer among your people nor shall you take a stand against the life of your neighbor I am Yahweh now what is a talebearer in the scriptures scripturally speaking what is a Tail bearer is it someone that goes around bearing tails? I mean, that's what it would se seem like in the English definition. Um, but what is the actual biblical definition? Now, if you were to break out your strongs and look up the word that's translated tail bearer there, and it's come from from seventy four hundred Rakil, which is from another word seventy four oh two, a scandal monger, as traveling about. Very interesting. And then it's translated different ways, slander, carry, tails, tail bearer. It's from 7402, which is a word that means to travel for trading. Very interesting. To travel for trading. So a tail bearer is someone that goes about from one place to another and tells different tales, different things. And um, Yahweh does not want us going about doing these things. It's like a merchant because a, a tailor goes from one person to another, but his wares and what he's selling are stories which malign the reputation of others. And, and those who buy into their stories are the purchasers of his stolen goods. It's stolen goods because he takes away the otherwise good name of his victims. 
Now, some would say, well, you know, if it's not false, it's not really tail-bearing. As long as it's something that's true, that's, th that's where we draw the line of where tail-bearing is tail-bearing. Now, I don't necessarily believe this, and I'll tell you why. Um, in, Levitic in Proverbs chapter 11, verse 13, we have the same word being used here. And what it says is, a tail-bearer reveals secrets, but he who is of a faithful spirit conceals a matter. And so, a secret can be something that's true and not false, and yet someone can commit the sin of tail-bearing when they go about and they reveal to others the secrets that a person has told them. Now, every single one of us have things uh, in our lives or um, things that we used to engage in or something that we would only tell a trusted friend about. And um, because it's not very flattering, obviously, and um, they're just things that just not anybody's business. And, um, and so for that trusted friend to go about and tell others about those matters is considered to be a form of tail-bearing or slander. And in fact, we are told in Scripture not to associate with a person who practices those things in Proverbs 20, verse 19. It says, He who goes about as a tail-bearer reveals secrets. Therefore, do not associate with one who flatters with his lips. Very interesting. You ever heard the term two-faced? A person when they're around you may act like your friend and speak well of you, but when they're not around you, they slander you. I'm sure all of us have probably come across people of this nature. And um, and the reason why they speak well of you is so that you'll trust them and then they can go off and tell others about you and they have a problem they have a problem with um, fear of rejection they want everybody to accept them and so they feel they need to knock everybody else down a notch in order for them to feel elevated and accepted and um, that's a real serious problem but uh, people who do that um, actually hide hatred in their heart they they when they're with you they uh, act like they're friends with you and they speak well of you but then when they're away they do just the opposite and scripture says he who whoever hides hatred has lying lips and whoever spreads slander is a fool now you see how they're connected there you have a person hiding their hatred and their lips are lying. They're acting like they like you. And then they go around and and spread their slander. And such as per, such a person in Scripture is called a fool. And so someone is telling you secrets about others. A word of advice. It's very likely they're the kind of person who would reveal secrets about you too. Never assume that just because you have a good relationship with this person and maybe they're being faithful in what they um, they don't go around and tell everybody now that they're always going to be on good terms with you and continue to speak well of you because one day you may do something that offends them rightfully or wrongfully and then they'll go off and treat you like all the other people that they speak evil of that's hurt them in the past and so, those are some things that we're called, we've got to be careful about not to associate with one who flatters with the lips and goes around and reveals the secrets of others. We've got to be very, very careful about that. Now, slander, like we said, does not have to be something that's false, but most of the time, it is. And if it isn't completely false, there'll be um, some half-truths and things that are um, made to look make you look bad. Now the goal of this slander is rejection. 
That's the goal of slander. The goal of slander, if someone's slandering you, they want no one to like you. They want everyone to dislike you. And so their goal is to divide and to split up and to cause others to hate you. That's their goal. Now, the enemy, Satan, he spends a great deal of time engaging in this very thing. In Revelation chapter 12 and verse 10, it says, Then I heard a loud, loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength in the kingdom of our Elohim and the power of his Messiah have come. For the accuser of our brethren, who accused them before Elohim day and night, has been cast down. Now, we don't know all the contents of his accusations here, but I'm sure that some of the accusations may even be true, while others are probably false. Now, his goal is rejection. He wants to turn Yahweh away from us. He wants, to, he wants to cause Yahweh to no longer have mercy on us. That's his goal. And so he uses the power of accusation and slander. This as he did. Remember the book of Job. Yahweh was speaking well of Job, saying, There's no one like him in the earth who fears Elohim and hates evil. And um, Satan came up to him and said, Well, does he serve you for nothing? You put this hedge around him and I can't touch him. But the minute I touch what he has, he'll curse you to his face. And so he was accusing and slandering Job, maligning his character about what he would do in the future. He couldn't nail him on what he, what he was doing today. He could only try to nail him on what he would do and uh, cause his motives to be uh, held in question. And, um, and so... That's what the enemy tries to do. That's his goal, is to cause Yahweh to uh, bring difficulties upon us and um, to have Yahweh do different things, to not have mercy on us and things like that. He's, he's on the other side of things. Because misery loves company, doesn't it? Well, those who follow after that same spirit pretty much act the same way. And they seek to cause accusation uh, in order to divide and to cause others to dislike the person that they're accusing. Now, think about this for a moment. We're, I mean, we're going to have slander. It's just the way it is. It's just part of this walk that we're in. We're going to receive it. Um, but, you know, imagine if you were the only person in the world who kept the Sabbath day, for instance. Now, suppose that somebody you knew saw you on the street one day and just started to publicly humiliate you in front of all your best friends for keeping the Sabbath day. And probably other people would be keeping the Sabbath if they were best friends. But, but maybe they would call you names, insult you, and say you're a Judaizer, legalist, someone that's fallen from grace, and... Um, now, that might rattle you a little bit, but suppose that um, somebody came in the room, on the, the chat room today, and started talking uh, bad about those who keep the Sabbath. Now, because we, uh, most of us in the room here all keep the Sabbath, it probably wouldn't even really phase us. Because there's strength in numbers. There's strength in numbers when we have others who are with us, together with us in our walk. We feel stronger. Well, the same enemy who accuses the brethren before Yahweh also wants to sow accusations and dissension in between brethren. And the goal is rejection. He wants us to reject each other and thereby create division between us. He wants to prevent um, people from liking each other and loving each other to cast a bad name on the people of Yahweh so the people will not meet together and people will not uh, commune with each other and draw strength from each other. He wants to divide us and when he divides us then he knows it's easier to conquer us. And so that's his goal among those who are 
brothers and sisters in the faith. Now, again, slander does not have to be false. It only needs to be harmful. It only needs to be harmful to the other person. Now, I want to take a look at the context of this Torah verse in um, Leviticus chapter 19 for a minute. It says, You shall not go about as a talebearer among your people, nor shall you take a stand against the life of your neighbor. You shall not hate your brother in your heart. You shall surely rebuke your neighbor and not bear sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, if there is ever any question as to whether something you are about to say about another person could be a violation of this commandment in Scripture, ask yourself whether it could sow any doubt in the other person's mind about the quality of that person's character. And if it would, then we should avoid saying it. Because we would not want that done to us, right? And so we should not do that to someone else. We don't want anything to create potential division and discord between brethren. Yahweh hates those who sow discord between brethren. Now, this does not just cover brethren. This covers everyone. Scripture says that we are not only to avoid speaking evil of other brothers and sisters in Yahweh. In Titus chapter 1, verses 1, we're going to read down through the end of verse, six, verse 5. It says, Remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities, to obey, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one. No one. To be peaceable, gentle, showing all humility to all men. For we ourselves were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But when the kindness and the love of Elohim our Savior appeared toward man appeared, <clears throat> not by works of righteousness, which we have done, <clears throat> But according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of the regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out upon us abundantly through Yahshua, our Savior. And so we are not to speak evil of anyone. Now, this does not mean that it's wrong to rebuke a neighbor or to rebuke a brother. We are permitted to openly rebuke a person who is clearly, openly involved in some kind of ongoing sin. In fact, the Proverbs tell us, Open rebuke is better than secret love. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. You see, the traits of an enemy are that they will kiss you, Speak well of you, flatter you in their presence, in your presence, but slander you behind your back. But a friend's corrections, though it may hurt, are always faithful even when done openly. If he is in the midst of some general sin, there's nothing wrong with rebuking him about that. Paul, remember, rebuked Kepha or Peter about his hypocrisy. Um, however, if it is a personal sin against you personally, all things must be done properly and in order. And Yahshua taught us how to handle these situations. In Matthew chapter 18, verse 15. Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. 
If he hears you, you have gained your brother. Now, this is probably one of the most disobeyed commandments in the body of Messiah today. I this 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 is so common that no one pays any attention to what Yahshua taught us here. Um, the commandment was given actually to to guard us against talebearing and against slander. If somebody sins against us, rather than go off and tell everybody about it, we are supposed to do what? Go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. Now, I don't mean hint around at your brother. Hey, I think you may have uh, offended me a little bit there. And it's kind of whispered, and that's where he doesn't really get the picture. And sometimes people do that and then jump to the next step. But make a clear, uh, unquestionable um, declaration that this was a wrong that was committed. So, we're to go directly to that person and them alone. Now, what, other, what usually happens is people go to others first. And um, they say, well, yeah, I want to, they'll, they'll come to you and they'll say, well, you know, I I want to seek counsel on this. You know, I I, uh, I have a prayer need um, and um, about this person, you know, I want to seek counsel. There's no counsel, brothers, that you need to seek. If someone did something wrong to you, uh, you don't need to counsel with anybody. You need to go to the person, and um, you don't have to ask anybody else, well, should I or shouldn't I? Um, yes, Yahshua said, you should. And so we should do exactly what he says when someone sins against us, and that's to go to them directly and privately. Now, we don't have to. We do not have to, every time somebody sins against us, go to them and tell them. Um, it's our choice whether or not we just choose to do what? Overlook it. Proverbs 19.11, The discretion of a man makes him slow to anger, and his glory is to overlook a transgression. But, if for some reason you can't seem to bear this, and you're having a hard time dealing with it, and you're so offended, and you can't seem to let it escape you, and just bear it, then you need to go to that person. He, Proverbs 17, verse 9, He who covers a transgression seeks love. So we can cover that transgression. But he who repeats a matter separates friends. And that's two different things that happen here. You can seek to cover it, or you can seek to repeat it. Repeat it to somebody else. Repeat it to them, if they've, even if they've already forgive, uh, asked forgiveness. Repeat it to them over and over again. And that creates division just as much as slander itself. Proverbs 16.28 says, A perverse man sows strife, and a whisperer separates the best of friends. And so, this is often what happens, brothers, is whisperers go out when a wrong is committed, and people that would otherwise be at peace and will love each other and forgive each other end up being at odds. And so the answer, brothers, is to go to the person directly. You know, because besides resolving any potential root of bitterness that may grow up within ourselves, or we're also blessing the other person by helping them go in a more correct direction. And it's an act of love for us to reprove our brother. It's an act of love. Because you don't want them to continue 
doing that wrong thing. Now, let's look at these verses here in Leviticus 19 again. It says, You shall not go about as a talebearer among your people, nor shall you take a stand against the life of your neighbor, I am Yahweh. You shall not hate your brother in your heart. You shall surely rebuke your neighbor and not bear sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And so, if we were to extract the principles in these verses, we would find that Yahweh wants us to rebuke our neighbor rather than resort to these other things. Tailbearing. If you don't rebuke your neighbor, you may go about as a tailbearer. In verse 17, hate your brother in your heart. If you don't rebuke your neighbor and tell him about it and he asks forgiveness, you may find yourself hating your brother in your heart. Number three, you'd be holding a grudge. It says, do not bear a grudge against the children of your people. And then fourthly, taking vengeance. So um, these are the alternatives to going to the other person and talking to them about it. And many people do res resort to one of these four sins rather than simply reproving their neighbor. And Yahshua's directive to go to the person privately and between him and you alone fits these precepts of love very beautifully. Because when we reprove them privately, we eliminate the possibility of tailbearing and slander. And his directive will also keep us from storing hatred and grudges in our heart toward others. And they keep us from being tempted to take vengeance by harming others through slander or in some other way. And at the same time, we learn to resolve things between one another and we find ourselves walking in love. And that's, you see, the four things that, that precede, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The antithesis, the, act, the opposite of that, is to hold hatred in your heart, to take vengeance, to bear grudges, and to be a talebearer. You know, a lot of times, and I, I find this, brothers, a lot, that um, when someone actually does go to the other person, um, and try to resolve it. A lot of times what appears to be a slight or a sin of some kind actually is just a misunderstanding. And uh, when one brother goes to the other brother privately, it resolves a very, very high percentage of problems, and it very, very rarely ever even needs to go to the next step. And, um, and so... Yahshua's directives in Matthew 18 to go to the person privately uh, fits these Torah principles in Leviticus 19 and brings peace between brethren and prevents the, the slander and the tailbearing and the grudges and the hatred and the taking vengeance and the bitterness. And then sin in the camp is dealt with rather than being allowed to fester and grow and continue. But what happens if you go to the person and they don't change? They don't repent. Now, we can still, if, we, if we're able to, just choose to overlook the transgression uh, and pray for the person. But if we're still struggling greatly with that, then it may be time to proceed to the next step. But if he will not hear, Matthew eighteen sixteen, take with you one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. Now, here, only at this time, after we've spoken to the person about it and been clear, are we allowed to bring another person into the picture? One or two other people. Not two or three other people, but one or two other people. Because you're one you're the one witness. Okay. And um now the witness you choose needs to be unbiased, a fair person who doesn't already have their own problems with grudges and bitterness, especially against the person that you're trying to work uh, to address. Uh, you want to find brethren with a track record of being a peacemaker, and that's, that's even better. Um, and then 
a lot of times a person, you know, they just won't repent because they honestly don't see what they're doing as being wrong. And maybe they need the counsel of two or three witnesses to help them see it. And it's not always possible. I'm sorry, it is always possible the other person uh, who's offended actually could be wrong, too. I mean, maybe you're offended about something and you're the one that's wrong. And so you bring another person or two into the picture, um, and it helps uh, maybe to put some balance into it. And uh, the person could say, well, you know, I don't think that that you're right on this. And I can't be a witness uh, on this person. And this is not making any sense to me. This, 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 then this is the reason why. Okay. Now, if one or two more have been brought to the person, um, and they all are unanimous, and it's decided that, you know, this wrong has been committed, the person is just being obstinate, they don't want to change, um, then the next step can be taken. Verse 17 in Matthew 18, And if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the assembly. But if he refuses even to hear the assembly, let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. Now, this kind of open rebuke is not sin. In fact, it is commanded. And this precept was followed by the first century assembly. You'll see it here in Paul's letter to Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 19-21. through 21. Do not receive an accusation against an elder except from two or three witnesses. Those who are sinning, in other words, they brought the witnesses, and they still haven't repented. Those who are sinning rebuke in the presence of all, that the rest also may fear. I charge you before Elohim and the Master Yahshua the Messiah and their elect angels that you observe these things without prejudice, doing nothing with partiality. That's very, very important. And so Timothy, who was commissioned to judge all things without prejudice, without partiality, was given this command to reject any accusation against an elder unless there were multiple witnesses. And this indicates the first two steps in Matthew 18 would have already been followed. And now it's time to bring the matter in front of the assembly. He was told to rebuke the elder in the presence of everyone so that the others would not follow that example and hopefully the elder would repent rather than being cast out of the assembly. Now this step can be a challenge to accomplish today to take it to the assembly because we have a little bit of a problem with cohesiveness um, the uh, body of Messiah let's face it is pretty fragmented and uh, we're not quite as organized as the first century assembly was and that presents some challenges um, they were in a different situation than we are today, and that they had all the truth, and we're trying to protect what they had. But due to the fact that our fathers have inherited lies, we've lost the truth, and we're trying to get back to it. And um, this interim period, there's a there's really a lack of clear, respected authority in the body of Messiah today. And those who have taken authority a lot of times are not qualified and tend to get involved in corruption and abuse their position. And so I'm not really sure what to do about that, but um, we do need to wait on, I guess we need to wait on Yahweh and see what he wants us to do. But you know, once, maybe if the body of Messiah was more faithful in observing the first two steps in Matthew 18, which is to go to the person privately and then, they don't hear you take one or two more. Maybe Yahweh would be faithful in supplying an answer of how we exactly walk out that third step. Now, it's a whole lot easier if it's a local congregation um, and everybody kind of lives in the same area. It's a little easier to deal with and, and to observe this. But, you know, on the Internet, you know, it's we don't really know each other that well. I mean, we only thing we know is what we see comes through a computer. 
and uh, you don't there's a lot of things you don't see and so you don't know the person and so you know I don't do Matthew 18 steps over the internet uh, at least not the third one maybe um, one or two more something like that over a telephone if they're long distance but um, but you know it's it's just the internet is just a anybody can be anything they want to be they can present themselves uh, it's when you meet a person and and uh, you're around them and you you know them and uh, you know their family you know uh, the character and uh, then then it's a little easier but um you know if if someone's done some kind of blatant sin let's say they committed adultery or something and they don't repent you bring one or two more and they don't repent and then wow it's, he's continuing to commit the adultery then um maybe there's ways that you know letters can be sent or or something to bring the person to accountability but anyway what do we do what do we do if there's a brother who habitually um repeatedly over a long period of time uh habitually hurts other people in some fashion um this let's take for instance let's say someone uh uh that's called himself a believer um in business matters tries to get brothers involved in business matters and then they end up taking advantage of the other person um is warning people about a person's past conduct considered to be a form of slander because the dilemma here is that if you say nothing then maybe uh that another person is going to be harmed but then if you do say something maybe the person who has the problem with the sin in the past um who maybe has repented they would be harmed and so um now i'm not aware of any examples in scripture where one brother needed to warn someone other someone else about a brother's past sins or i've yet to hear of a situation where it was really needed um because if the steps in Matthew 18 are followed faithfully, a lot of that's going to be resolved. Because the likelihood is if someone sins against a brother seven times a day, part of his repentance would be a discussion of accountability and making amends and making restitution. Um, and then if they ever got to the third step, then everybody is already notified this person has committed this wrong. But suppose there is a situation that would arise where you saw someone who is in, in potentially imminent danger and Matthew 18 wasn't properly followed before and um, there are maybe some practical steps that we could do uh, to prevent someone else from being harmed in the same situation. Number one, prayer. Prayer. Um, Yahweh a lot of times will step in. I mean, sometimes we act like he's not even around. <laughs> um, but Yahweh can step in himself if we pray diligently. It's not like Yahweh's hands are tied and he can do nothing to help the situation to prevent another person from being hurt. Uh, number two, if you believe Yahweh wants you to help, then prayerfully maybe you can go to this brother who had the sinful past and encourage them to be open and honest about it with the other person and maybe bring one or two more persons with you who are already familiar with previous situations but in everything that you do come to them in a spirit of gentleness knowing that you also need Yahweh's mercy on the day of judgment uh, third thing maybe it's appropriate for you to offer to be that person that they're accountable to in this future dealing, whatever it's, whatever's going on. You know, but the goal, brothers, is to love. That's the goal. The goal is to avoid animosity between believers. And um, if the person who has repeated this sin in the past is truly repentant, they wouldn't demand and get too offended if someone doesn't trust them again. That's understandable. 
Um, and so, but you don't want there to be division between you and the other party. You want to put your arm around your brother because you have your own sin to deal with as well and help to bear his burdens. And I mean, he can help you bear yours. And that's what it's all about. But let's say he won't be open about it. He refuses to be accountable to anyone. Well, that's not a sign that Matt, that he's really repentant. That he's. And so there may be cases when uh, I think they're very rare that you may have to offer a word of caution. And sometimes you can do it just by giving a general warning and not mentioning anyone by name, but uh, other times, I don't know, maybe you need to. Now, those who are outside the body of Messiah cannot be dealt with in the same way that believers are. They aren't covered under Matthew 18 proceedings since they're already outside the body of Messiah, and the practical steps may not work. Or maybe they're a decent person in some areas, and maybe it would. But we do find examples where believers were warned about unbelievers. Uh, Paul warned about Alexander the coppersmith. Uh, John warned about the the atrophies. Uh, Yahshua warned others about scribes and Pharisees. And that's biblical and wise. But if a person is warning you about someone and they mix in things that are true and things that are not true, they're already automatically tail-bearing. Or, if he's telling people who don't really need to be warned, then that's tail-bearing and slandering. And so we need to, we need to recognize the, uh, what slander is, what tail-bearing is, and uh, the kind of damage that it can do. Now, I shared a little bit earlier, but um, slander comes as in different disguises. Um, it comes in the disguise of um, I need counsel. I need some. I really need some counsel about this situation. Uh, there's a brother over here that's done this, 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 this. What do you think I should do? Another way it comes in is, oh, you know, we need to pray about so-and-so. We need to pray for this person. Um, they've done this. They've, they've done that. We need to pray, pray for this person. Or I feel I should warn you about so. Or I have a burden about this person over here who's engaging this activity. Um, these are the, the disguises that slander and tail-bearing will sometimes come dressed in. Now, Yahshua commanded a principle that would eliminate most of these things. Uh, and probably all, all tail-bearing and slander and gossip in the, in, in the assembly would be eliminated if everyone would just follow Matthew 18. His His teachings beautifully fit within the Torah principles of Leviticus 19 are very needed today. Now, I want to say that, you know, some people have mistakenly thought that um, that if a person was to publicly state that they disagree with a teaching that is presented by another brother, that this is automatically tail-bearing. Or slander. Um, but I say no, not necessarily. Um, there are practical and safe ways of disagreeing with somebody and their beliefs without engaging in slander. For instance, you could say, well, I've read this teaching by Eliyah, and um, I just don't agree with it, and here's why. And that's not, nothing wrong with that. That's not slander, uh, stating your disagreement. Or um, I could say, you know, you know, this person has that, that point of view. I feel that, they, uh, that they're wrong, and here's why, and here's the scriptures that I see that says uh, this is wrong. And, um, but it's when we go into another zone altogether, and begin to judge the person's motives as being wrong. Let's say, 
well, so-and-so has taught this, and I think the reason why they taught this is because they have bitterness against so-and-so. And so they taught this thing, right? Or um, this person, you know, they just don't really want to seek the truth that much, and so they haven't really done a, a thorough job, and they believe this and that and the other. And that's when it becomes slanderous. Um, now, if you hear about another person who is coming to you and saying, well, this person, they... They teach this, they teach that, and they're wrong. Um, you can just say, well, if that's what that person really believes, that's what they're teaching, of course, I would not agree with that. Now, that, that communicate, communicates your disagreement without slandering the person. And um, now, because none of us have all the answers, I mean, in and, and disagreement, and communicating reasons for disagreement is going to actually help us as a body of Messiah to become more uh, refined and to find the truth together. And that's okay. Nothing wrong with that. It's when you start attacking the character of the person that um, that's when you cross that line. And so... These are some of the definitions that I that I have been able to gather from looking at different scripture verses of what tailbearing actually is, what slander actually is. Now, I think it's important for us to have a good definition because the scriptures that speak about this very thing are brothers that's very, very strong, very strong. I'm going to share some of these. Tailbearing and slander is a very serious matter, and I think it deserves recognition because it's actually influenced by the spirit of murder. The spirit of murder. And one of the things that struck me as I examined the scriptures on this very topic is how often tailbearing and slander is compared to the sin of murder. Let's look at an example here in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 24 and verses 8 through 9. David, let's talk about King David here, also arose afterward, went out of the cave and called out to Saul, saying, My master the king. And when Saul looked behind him, David stooped with his face to the earth and bowed down. And David said to Saul, Why do you listen? to the words of men who say, Indeed, David seeks your harm. Look, this day your eyes have seen... Oh, back up. Indeed, look, this day your eyes have seen that Yahweh delivered you today into my hand in the cave, and someone urged me to kill you. But my eye spared you, and I said, I will not stretch out my hand against my master, for he is Yahweh's anointed. You see, when a man hates another man, his conscience may not permit him to murder a person, but instead he may seek to destroy with the mouth. Now in this case, we see that it was slander that was influencing Saul to chase David all over the countryside. And try to kill him. Someone was saying that David seeks Saul's harm. And David was saying, why do you listen to the words of those men? It's not true. So David was being slandered. And that's what brought about the desire for Saul to chase David. And spend all his time and energy chasing David all over the Judean hills to kill the man. Now, another verse here. Leviticus 19.16, it says, You shall not go about as a talebearer among your people. Now look at the comparison here. It says, Nor shall you take a stand against the life of your neighbor. You see, when a man hates another man, maybe his conscience would not permit him to murder the person. And so instead, he seeks to destroy the person with his mouth. The difference is that murder destroys the body, 
and tail bearing destroys the person emotionally in some cases spiritually you see there's a mur the murderous spirit behind tail bearing is seen in this the way this commandment's written here now in a court of law a tail bearer could be a false witness that ultimately resulted in a death penalty in the court of public opinion in public record though tail bearing results in the wounding of another man and sometimes irreparably this is because the harm done to a person through tail bearing is not something that can be easily repaired you ever heard the story of the uh, the rabbi and the and the and the pillow if you haven't heard the story i'm going to tell you the story there was a um a man who had slandered a uh, so-called rabbi a jewish leader but a jewish teacher i'll put it that way and um and then later found out the things he was slandering this teacher uh about were not true and uh and so he came to that teacher and he said i realize i have done something wrong i have slandered you i have misunderstood I did not um, do it. I did not uh, speak well of you. I did not. Uh, I lied. I basically spread false reports. Is there anything I can do to make it up? And the Jewish teacher said, "Yes." He says, "I want you to take uh, a, a feather pillow, and I want you to go up to the high hill that's above the city here." And I want you on a windy day to go out there and 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 take apart the feather pillow and shake the feathers off and, and so that the feathers go out into the wind. And the man says, okay, I'll do that. So he went up on a windy day and um, he took the feather pillow and he uh, broke it open and released all the feathers into the air. And then he went back to the Jewish teacher and he said, I've done what you said. He says, okay, now here's how you can make it up. He says, go out and pick up all those feathers that were scattered to the wind. You see, the point is, once that slander went out, it went to another person, to another person, to another person, to another person, and you can never regather all that damage that was done. Very, very difficult to regather all those feathers, isn't it? Now, slander is is uh, compared to violence in Proverbs chapter ten, verse six. It says, "Blessings are on the head of the righteous, but violence covers the mouth of the wicked." And so a person who chooses to slander may not be physically violent, but his tongue is pouring out violence. Psalm 52, verse 1. It says, Why do you boast in evil, O mighty man? The goodness of Elohim endures continually. Your tongue devises destruction, like a sharp razor working deceitfully. You love evil more than good, Lying than speaking righteousness. Your love, you love all devouring words, you deceitful tongue. Elohim shall likewise destroy you forever. He shall take you away and pluck you out of your dwelling place and uproot you from the land of the living. Another place, Psalm 140. Preserve me from violent men who plan evil things in their hearts. They continually gather together for war. They sharpen their tongues like a serpent. The poison of asps is under their lips. Keep me, O Yahweh, from the hands of the wicked. Preserve me from violent men who have purposed to make my steps stumble. Now David calls these violent men, the violent tongue. And the violent tongue will often result in that evil returning 
to them. Psalm 140 verse 11 says, Let not a slanderer be established in the earth. Let evil hunt the violent man to overthrow him. So once again we see a tongue being compared to violence. Now those of us who understand the importance of names, all of us understand the importance of Yahweh's name, and uh, we should all understand that a good name is to be chosen rather than great riches. Proverbs 22, verse 1. Loving favor rather than silver and gold. Now, when someone slaughters a person's name, they slaughter the person. Just as someone was to, if someone was to malign the name of Yahweh, and blaspheme the name of Yahweh. They would blaspheme the person because they're intricately linked with one another. You know, when someone engages in that kind of thing, those who slander others, you know, they're automatically playing the hypocrite. It's the perfect picture of one sinner speaking evil about another person for supposedly sinning. And he becomes a hypocrite because it's a, it, it is a sin to slander. And so if you're speaking evil about a person, about something they did, or you think they did, then you just engaged in a sin yourself. And so it says in Proverbs 11, verse 9, The hypocrite with his mouth destroys his neighbor. But through knowledge, the righteous will be delivered. And so next time you consider repeating something that may harm someone else, consider these scriptures. We need to remember the, the dangers of this, because if we would be, if, if this was one of the things that we engage in, Yahweh calls this an absolute abomination. Proverbs 6, verse 16. These six things Yahweh hates. Yes, seven are an abomination to him. A proud look. First comes pride. A lying tongue. Then comes something out of the mouth. Hands that shed innocent blood. A heart that devises wicked plans. Feet that are swift to running to evil. A false witness who speaks lies. And one who sows discord among a brethren. You see, slander spiritually destroys the innocent, and those with proud looks and lying tongues and false or false witnesses that are quick to run to this evil, and they plan it out, and they shed innocent blood spiritually with their lies and create discord between brethren. So the, all, all these abominations are really covered under slander. So do we see the dangers of participating in these things? You know, very serious words are spoken in Scripture about those who slander in secret. And I'm thankful to Yahweh he showed me this verse very early in my walk. Psalm 101 verse 5 says, Whoever secretly slanders his neighbor, him I will destroy. The one who has a haughty look and a proud heart, him I will not endure. Pride and slander go hand in hand. But notice it says, him I will destroy. Now when I read this verse, I was, I mean, I was just totally blown away. I couldn't hardly believe just with such a simple thing as speaking a word. Some people say, oh, it's just words. Just words. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. The tongue is a, is a, a world of iniquity, a deadly poison, just a, a little fire that grows and grows and grows. And, um, you know, the goal, the goal of every believer needs to be that we love our fellow man. That needs to be our goal. And none of us would want to be slandered by another person. In fact, most of us would put that as one of the characteristics we most despise. 
And so it's very foolish. And I know it's tempting sometimes, but it's very foolish to engage in this practice. Whoever spreads slander is a fool. All the things that Proverbs talk about, the fool, if we spread slander, that's what we are. Now, Romans chapter 1, verse 28 through 32, it says, And even as they did not like to retain Elohim in their knowledge, Elohim gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. Well, what is some of the characteristics of those who have a debased mind? It says, Being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, Deceit, evil-mindedness, they are whisperers, backbiters, haters of Elohim, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful. Those are characteristics of one who has a debased mind, who knowing the righteous judgment of Elohim that that those who practice such things are deserving of death. Not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. Now, if we want to enter into eternal life and abide in the tabernacle of Yahweh, here's what we need to do. Psalm of David, Psalm 15, verses 1 through 3. Yahweh, who may abide in your tabernacle? Who may dwell in your holy hill? He who walks uprightly and works righteousness and speaks the truth in his heart. He who does not backbite with his tongue, nor does evil to his neighbor, nor does he take up a reproach against his friend. Very serious things. And also Second Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, it says, But know this, that in the last days, Perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure, rather than lovers of Elohim, having a form of reverence denying its power, and from such people, what? Turn away. Turn away. Now, what comes into the mind will often affect what goes out of the mouth. And so we are called to avoid evil speaking and instead cleave to the word of Yahweh. It says, Therefore, laying aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and evil speaking as newborn babes, Desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. If indeed you've tasted Yahweh's graces. And so we need to lay aside evil speaking. James 4, verse 11 through 12. Do not speak evil of one another, brethren. He who speaks evil of a brother and judges his brother speaks evil of the law and judges the law. But you... If you judge the law, you're not a doer of the law, but a judge. Now, why is this? Why, why is it that a person who speaks evil of another person speaks evil of the Torah, the law? Well, when a person slanders his brother in whom Yahshua, the living Torah, dwells, he slanders the, the law because he is a part of the body of the Messiah, and Yahshua is the living Torah, the living word of Yahweh dwelling among us. And in the least, as we have done it to the least of our brethren, we've done it to him. We are destroying the body of Messiah when we choose to speak evil of one of its members. And so there's one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who are you to judge another? Now, when a person murders another person physically, he is usurping Yahweh's authority as lawgiver and life giver. 
It says there is one lawgiver who is able to save and destroy. Who are you to judge another? That's James 4.12. I'm sorry I missed that. But that's what's happening. There's one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. That's Yahweh. And when we choose to engage in slander, we're choosing to destroy. We're destroying another person, and in, in so doing, we're destroying the body of the Messiah. That's a very serious thing. <coughs> and so, when a person murders another person verbally, he is usurping Yahweh's authority as lawgiver, setting himself up as a judge of who to save and to destroy, and becomes a judge of the law rather than a doer. And so rather than doing the law, which forbids tail-bearing and slander, he becomes a judge, takes over the position of lawgiver. And so when we choose to create our own set of rules, our own set of judgments, then Yahweh will judge us by the judgment with which we judged. And therefore, it says, Matthew 7, 1, Judge not that you be not judged, for with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with what measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Judge not, you shall not be judged. Condemn not, you shall not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. You know, hypocrisy is often involved. And if you're really feeling, and, and beware of this, brothers, because if you're really feeling agitated by something that someone does. Take that moment right there and ask yourself if you are or ever have been guilty of the same thing. And ask Yahweh to show you because a lot of times that agitation is from the enemy. Trying to get you to be a hypocrite. So a lot of times the things that agitate a person the most are the very things they're guilty of. Not always, but a lot of times. Romans chapter 2, verse 1, Therefore you are inexcusable, O man, whoever you are, who judge. For in whatever you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same thing. And so next time you think about speaking evil of the person and, and, and to murmur against him or grumble about them, remember the door. Remember the door. Do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. James chapter 5 and verse 9. Now, the things that are the works of the flesh are the things which should not be in the body of Messiah. And Paul was concerned about it. He says, I fear lest when I come, 2 Corinthians 10, 12, verses 20 through 21, I shall not find you as I wish, and I shall be found by you such as you do not wish. Lest there be contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, backbitings, whisperings, conceits, tumults. Lest when I come again, my Elohim shall humble me among you, and I shall mourn for many who have sinned before and have not repented of uncleanness, fornication, and lewdness which they practiced. Now, the root of, of tail-bearing sometimes is typically unforgiveness and bitterness. And so it says, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31 let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as Elohim and Messiah forgave you. See, the bitterness grows into evil speaking, tail-bearing, and then that, in turn, grows into strife. Where there is no wood, the fire goes out. Where there is no tailbearer, strife ceases. <coughs> so tailbearing is the wood for the fire of strife. 
you know the strife among brethren a lot of times even between uh husband and wife two people just slandering each other and then defending one another defending themselves from the slander and um and you'll see you'll see that in in disagreements between brothers too between uh children and so on and you know bitterness in the heart will create these problems um in our abilities to judge fairly without partiality and judgments become made about the character of other people through the lenses of bitterness and bearing false witness against others becomes a habit and in those cases the slander actually breaks another commandment a very very important one Exodus 20:16 you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor you now most people today when they think of false witness they think oh don't lie that's what that means well that's true but the actual commandment involves being a false witness about another person Yahweh commanded the judges of Israel to be diligent be fair-minded in their inquiry before judging a person as being guilty about anything and if a false witness was to speak before the judges in condemnation about another person the very punishment that they sought to give the other person they will actually receive Deuteronomy 19 verse 16 to 21 says if a false witness rises against any man to testify against him of wrongdoing then both the men of the controversy shall stand before Yahweh before the priests and the judges who serve in those days and the judges shall make careful inquiry, and if indeed the witness is a false witness who has testified falsely against his brother, then you shall do to him as he thought to have done to his brother. So you shall put away the evil from among you, and those who remain shall hear and fear, and hereafter they shall not again commit such evil among you. Your eyes shall not pity, life shall be for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand foot for foot and so with such a righteous law we can understand why by the mouth of two or three witnesses every matter could be established because if anyone rose up against someone as a false witness and they were exposed then they would be given the same punishment they thought to give to their neighbor risking their own life now, brethren, so often, and I mean so often, I've seen where, where people are very quick to judge the character of another person and um, without hardly any inquiry at all, just because they think they got discernment. You know, quick snap judgments about uh, another person's character or accusations that someone's doing something wrong when in reality the person hasn't done anything wrong and I've seen where someone has, has assassinated the character and the name of another person and uh, based on suspicions and phony spiritual discernment when in reality there's this unclean spirit depositing these thoughts in their mind about the other person and uh, I've also seen these things being done privately and without the other person's knowledge and it spreads like wildfire because the tongue well the tongue is a fire James 3 verse 6 through 12 a world of iniquity the tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature is set on fire by Gehenna for every kind of beast and bird reptile this creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Elohim and Father, and with it we curse men, who have been made in the similitude of Elohim. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not be so. 
Does a spring send fresh water and bitter from the same opening? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives, or a grapevine bear figs? Thus no spring yields both salt water and fresh. And so that is a very important point. Our tongue is unruly. We need to get the bitterness out of our heart. Because you, if it's bitterness is in your heart, brothers, you can't tame that tongue. It's going to come out. You've got to get the bitterness out of the heart. And we've got to be careful that what we say about another person, number one, is not slander. Number two, is not false. In Exodus 23, verse 1, You shall not circulate a false report. Do not put your hand with the wicked to be an unrighteous witness. A lot of times you get these email forwards about some political leader, whether it's George Bush, uh, Obama, or whatever. You get these emails, and they're pointing out, oh, this guy, he's bad because of this. He's bad because of that. You know, most of the time when you investigate, those emails are lies. They're lies. Um, and it says, Keep yourself far from a false matter. Do not kill the innocent and the righteous, for I will not justify the wicked. And so do not circulate those false reports. Keep yourself far from them. Because we don't want to imitate the devil. This word, um, devil, is actually used in Luke 16, 1 through 2. And it says, he said also unto his disciples, there was a certain rich man who had a steward, and the same was accused unto him that he had wasted his goods. Accused. That word translated accused is Diablo, from which we get Diablos, the word translated devil. And so we don't want to imitate Diablo. Diablo is Diabloing us constantly. And so, it says the great dragon was cast out called Diablo, and Satan, who deceives the whole world, he was cast to the earth, his angels were cast out with him. I heard a loud, vo loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and kingdom of our Elohim and the power of his Messiah have come for the accuser of our brethren who accused him before Elohim day and night has been cast down. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony did not love their lives to the death. You see, the devil is quite active in accusing their brethren before Yahweh day and night. And he wants to deposit thoughts in your head of accusation toward everyone around you. The goal is rejection. The result, divide and conquer. Now sometimes slander and tailbearing, even if speaking the things are true, is actually rooted in pride and the thrill of feeling superior to another person. You know, to, tell, to tell a story about how bad another person is or how bad another person was actually can be rooted in pride and the desire to ease our own conscience. This mindset of, you know, at least I'm not as bad as so-and-so. They did this, this, that, and that, and the other. Has a way of easing our own conscience about our own failures, our own sins in our life, and makes us feel better about ourselves. And so we ease our own conscience at the expense of another person. That's hypocrisy and a sign that repentance is not in our heart. And that's, this condition right here, where I just told this thought of, well, you know, when you start talking about this other person, it makes you kind of feel like you're in a little club with, with this other guy you're telling it to, like you guys are better than the other person. There's pride there. And that's probably one of the reasons, the main reasons, that people practice these kind of things, um, 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 13. It says, And besides, they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but also gossips and busybodies, saying things which they ought not. 
You know, if uh, there's a neighborhood and and all there are fifty houses in the neighborhood, and all fifty of the people in the neighborhood had committed ten plus murders, the one guy who only committed one murder. You know, he might think, oh, he's he's doing pretty well, you know. And um, he might even talk bad about, you know, I've only done one, you know. These other people, they, they do 10, 12, 15, they don't care. I just did one. See, they're comparing themselves with others, and it's not wise. And um, and there's there's ways that, that, that people practice this um, today. You know, they'll say, well... Yeah, this other person over here, they did this really terrible thing, and it's awful, and uh, I, I would not stand for that, and on and on and on and on. And they're really just covering their own failures, their own transgressions, and making themselves feel better because they're not as bad as so-and-so down the road. But you know what? If we engage in this kind of behavior, Yahweh says we have no right to declare His statutes. We have no right to talk about his Torah. This is some mysterious stuff he's saying in the scriptures. To the wicked, Elohim says, What right have you to declare my statutes or take my covenant in your mouth, seeing you hate instruction and cast my words behind you? When you saw a thief, you consented with him and become a partaker with adulterers. You give your mouth to evil. Your, your tongue frames deceit. You sit and speak against your brother. You slander your own mother's son. These things you have done, and I have kept silent. You thought I was altogether like you. But I will rebuke you, and set them in order before your eyes. Now consider this, lest you forget Elohim, lest I tear you to pieces, and there be none to deliver. Whoever offers praise glorifies me. And to him who orders his conduct aright, I will show the salvation of Elohim. That is a powerful, powerful psalm. Brothers, we got to realize how serious this is and how dangerous this is. And take heed. It's a serious matter in Yahweh's eyes. Now, I want to talk to you about the dangers of listening, listening to slander. You see, the problem with listening to slander is that it hurts three people. The person speaking the slander, it hurts them. It also hurts the person hearing the slander. And then thirdly, of course, it hurts the person whom it's about. Because those who speak the slander are sinning against Yahweh with their tongue, those who listen to the slander are tempted to think wrongly and evil of another person. And that can bring defilement into the heart. And of course, the person who's being slandered hurts them also. But here's what happens. It brings defilement into the heart. Proverbs 18, verse 8. The words of a talebearer are like tasty trifles. And they go down into the inmost body. And again, Proverbs twenty six twenty two: the words of a talebearer are like tasty trifles. They go down into the inmost body. They this proverb gets repeated twice. And you know, sometimes Yahweh repeats something twice. It seems like Yahweh permitted this in order to teach us that hey, this is important. Pay attention. Now, the word translated tasty trifles comes from the Hebrew word laham, which means to swallow greedily. Why do people greedily swallow these things? Oh, they're pretty juicy. That's, that tail bearing and slander are pretty juicy stuff. And they're usually swallowed greedily by those who lack self control. And that's why it goes down into the inmost parts of the body. That's true. You know, one word of slander about another person, one word, and you never are the same. Yahweh forbid. 
because that little tasty trifle, if you swallow it, will defile you going down to the innermost part, and you never look at that person, the same. even if you don't believe it. That little doubt pops in your mind. What if that's true? Do you see what I mean? Just even a hint of negativity about another brother in Yahweh, and these walls start popping up. And division and discord um, are quite possibly on the way. And so we cannot eat these tasty trifles, brothers. We can't. We're told in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14 through 15, Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see Yahweh. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of Elohim, lest any root of bitterness spring up, trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. See, tasty trifles create division, discord, bitterness between two people who would otherwise be at peace with each other. And all it takes is one word, and you're never the same. Yahweh forbid. You see, the danger also of listening to tail-bearing is that it feeds the tail-bearer too. Proverbs 17, verse 4. An evildoer gives heed to false lips. A liar listens eagerly to a spiteful tongue. And so when somebody engages in these things, we need to realize, wait, they're violating Yahweh's law and sinning against their brother, which says to not go about as a tail-bearer among the people. And so what can we do to shut the mouth of a tail-bearer? How can we cause tail-bearing and slander to cease among brethren? There's only one way I know, and that's not give the guy an audience. You know? <laughs> if if you don't if you don't engage and, and, and listen and have anything to do with it, then you could call him out on it. Then he has no audience, and so he's going to give up that, that way of trying to hurt somebody. And so here's some practical things you can do. If it's a matter of personal sin against the person speaking it, ask, ask him. You ever gone privately to that person about this, like Yahshua told us to? And I can tell you from experience, most people don't. Most people do not, and if you tell them that, they're like, oh, well, um, well, I kind of, you know, said, uh, what did you say? Well, you know, they don't, they didn't do it. They just didn't do it. And so that that's a sin. Uh, another thing you can say. Say something against the other person that is, the person is tail-bearing, of course. You know, it can be mild, like uh, I'm feeling a little uncomfortable about this conversation um, about this other person. Uh, or maybe a little stronger one, like, uh, if, you know, if, if so-and-so knew you were saying these things about them, I think they'd be really hurt. Or maybe even stronger, uh, Yahweh's word forbids speaking evil of others, and I don't really want to be a part of this or to be tempted to think bad about someone. Shuts the mouth of a tail bearer. Another way to do it, immediately go and tell the person who's being spoken evil of, hey, uh, this person um, speaking evil of you, and um, I think that you need to talk to them about it. Another way, Speak something in the defense of the person being speaking of. You know, you, you said this, but you know, I've noticed that so-and-so did or said this. I'm not really sure you're correct about that. Now, I'm going to tell you something. It takes boldness. It takes boldness to call out a slanderer. Because you know this person engages in slander, and so you might be next. 
But aren't we supposed to lay down our lives for our brothers? Isn't that the heart of what love's all about? That slanderer is speaking evil of your brother, and you're afraid to call him on it because you're afraid that he might speak evil of you too, and so in your desire to be preserved and to not have slander on you, you're not willing to lay down your life for your brother. Where's the love? But that's what happens. That's why people are afraid to speak up. They're afraid because they don't want to get involved. I guess they don't love their brother. It's a serious, serious transgression in Yahweh's eyes. And we need to be we, we need to love our brothers and we need to deliver them who are drawn toward death. And this person has a spirit of murder, they're slandering your brother. We're supposed to deliver them. You say, Oh, we did not know this. Does not he who weighs the hearts consider it? He who keeps your soul, does he not know it? Will he not render to each man according to his deeds? You know, verbal murder can be worse than physical in some ways because, you know, somebody kills your body. I mean, you're dead. You didn't, you know, but if someone was to verbally assault you and try to murder you verbally, um, well, then you have to live with that. And so... These are the ways I encourage us to respond to the slander. Because I don't know of any other way to stop it. That's the only way I know to stop it, is to call them on it. Tell them how wrong it is. And to go to that person and deal with it. And so, we should realize um, that this is a real issue in the body of Messiah. And this is how we can deal with it. Now, I want to say that uh, even though it ought not be, um, receiving slander is a normal part of being a believer. It's normal. It's it's to be expected. You, if you know, if you're not able to handle it, then you haven't counted the cost. Jeremiah got it. Jeremiah chapter nine. He said, Oh, that my head were, were waters, and my eyes a fountain of tears, that I might weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. Oh, that I had in the wilderness a lodging place for travelers, that I might leave my people and go from them. For they are all adulterers, an assembly of treacherous men. And like their bow, they have bent their tongues for lives. They are not valiant for truth on the earth. For they proceed from evil to evil, and they do not know me, says Yahweh. Everyone take heed to his neighbor, and do not trust thy any brother, for brother will utterly supplant, and every neighbor will walk with slanderers. Even Yahshua gave an example. Um... Oh, I'm sorry. I, like Yahshua, as Yahshua gave us an example. Sometimes the best thing, if someone is speaking evil of you uh, directly, is to say nothing. Psalm 38, verses 12 through 14. Those also who seek my life lay snares for me. Those who seek my heart hurt speak of destruction and plan deception all the day long. But I, like a deaf man, do not hear. I am mute like a one who does not open his mouth. Thus I am like a man who does not hear, and his mouth is no response. For in you, O Yahweh, I hope. You will hear, O Master, my Elohim. For I said, Hear me, lest they rejoice over me, lest when my foot slips they exalt themselves, themselves against me. Now, there's nothing wrong with defending yourself. Now, but there's a time to be quiet. I mean, Second Corinthians, if you read it, um, a large portion of the letter is Paul defending the ministry that Yahweh gave him. But you got to be wise. Now, and so if if now if we're overly concerned about getting slandered, I can tell you already you're going to be disappointed. Um, 
Yahshua was slandered many times. The assembly was slandered many times. It's something we need to um, understand it goes with the program. But we can rejoice in the blessings that come out of this. Matthew 5.11 says, Bless are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Blessed are you. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Matthew 10, 25, It is enough for the disciple that he be as his master, and the servant as his master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more shall they call them of his own household? Fear them not, therefore, for there is nothing covered that, covered that shall not be revealed, and hid that shall not be known. What I tell you in darkness, that speak in the light, which you hear in the ear, and preach, that preach ye on the housetops. Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in Gehenna. Now, when other people slander us, Sometimes, the only thing we need to do is let our conduct reprove them. First Peter 3.15-17 through 17, But sanctify Yahweh Elohim in your hearts, and always be ready to give defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that's in you, with meekness and fear, having a good conscience that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Messiah may be ashamed. For it is better, if it is the will of Elohim, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. And then another biblical response is to bless. And we labor, 1 Corinthians 4, 12 through 13, working with our own hands, being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we endure. Being defamed, we entreat. That's another thing we can do. We can entreat. We have been made as the filth of the world, the offscaring of all things until now. But one thing is sure, brothers, we cannot return evil for evil. Finally, all of you, First Peter 3, 8, be of one mind, having compassion for one another, love as brothers, be tender-hearted, be courteous, not returning evil for evil, or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. For he who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil, and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good, let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of Yahweh, as we shared last week, are on the righteous. And his ears, the ears of Yahweh, are open to their prayers. But the face of Yahweh is against those who do evil, of which, speaking deceit, speaking evil of others. And so, brothers, let's refrain our tongue from evil. Let's seek and pursue that peace with one another by following the commandments of Yahshua the Messiah in Matthew 18. If we would rather just give it to Yahweh and let it go, He'll hear our prayers. But two wrongs never equal one right. Two wrongs cannot make a right. If they wrong you, to defame them and slander them is evil for evil. And what Yahshua taught us and what he showed us was that we're different. We're different than the world. Because the world, they only love those who love them. But we were called to love them who do not love us. Aren't we? If we love those who love us, well, what, what reward do we have? What better are we than the heathen? Even they do that. But we're called to love those who don't love us. That's the high calling. That's the Messiah-like way. That's the righteous way. 
to conduct ourselves because our responsibility is to Elohim. And if we do evil just as they do, we're no better than they are. And we're not thinking about our responsibility to Elohim, to be holy in our conduct, in our speech, and that our hearts be pure. And so we can't tolerate these kinds of things in our, in our lives, in our hearts, in the assembly. Instead, we need to seek edification, building up the body of Messiah rather than tearing it down. No army divided against itself is going to stand. No army. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, Ephesians 4.29. But what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of Elohim, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as Elohim and Messiah forgave you. And so the question you can always ask yourself, does it edify? Does it build up? Does it strengthen the body of Messiah? Or does it tear it down and weaken it? Could it be potentially harmful to them? If so, don't wound the body of Messiah. But learn to care for it, to love it, and to cherish it. And so, let's love one another. After all, this is a sign of who Yahshua's disciples truly are. We're the ones that need to be showing a light to the world in Torah keeping. And so we need to let our light shine brightly in the area of refusing and rejecting, tail-bearing and slander, and seek compassion, mercy, love, and forgiveness instead. After all, hasn't Yahshua forgot, forgiven us for so many things and overlooked so many things? And didn't he bear our reproach time and time again? Didn't he set a wonderful example of patience in dealing with his disciples? It seemed like they just didn't really care sometimes. I mean, they were, he was telling them, I'm going to be killed in three days and um, rise again. And they're all, oh, well, who's going to be the greatest? You know, so uncaring. But he just patiently explained, well, he who's greatest will be servant of all. And if we're his body, that's our focus, that we're going to be walking worthy of that high honor of being a member of his body. Let's build the relationships together, keep ourselves from the elements that would threaten our love for each other. Let's forgive and forget. Love and rejoice in being loved. And while we may not agree on every little thing, let's keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace and being sure that that glue of unity does not grow brittle, grip, grow brittle or weak. The glue, brothers, is the bond of peace. I therefore, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, the prisoner of the master to beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you are called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. That's a, that is what we need to seek. And let's look at anything that would undermine that as an enemy in our midst that we need to deal with and that we need to stop. May Yahweh bless you and may Yahweh have mercy on us all.